Good morning and welcome to Grace Chapel. What a beautiful day. When I wake up on a day like today, I think of that old hymn my grandmother used to sing, there is sunshine in my soul today. Because it doesn't seem like the sunshine is any other place, but this is a high day for us. This is an exciting day and I think you all know why, but I'll leave that to a few other people to talk about a little bit later. Hey, if you get here early on a Sunday morning when the orchestra is playing, this is probably what you'll hear. Frank, could you give us an A? Could we just take a tuny note real quick? What do we? Go ahead. Okay, that's enough of that. Thanks. So I just wanted you to know that we don't just pull these instruments out and expect them to be in tune. It's just like our own hearts. You know, the day starts, and we ask God to come into that heart. And to get it in tune, get it lined up with the things that God would want for us. Let's sing together. Let's stand and sing, come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. One and
come here today from all sorts of situations. People come, some of us, with a week that was filled with great joy and victory and promise. But let's not forget, others of us have come with great despair and disappointment. But all of us come to the foot of the cross where we meet our Savior and we learn the truth and the love that transforms us. So let's listen to that word and sing together. Savior, friend, we bow our hearts before you. May the earth be filled with your glory that all might know you and receive your grace. Continue with us, O oh God, as we continue to worship you. Pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.
Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Chapel. My name is Rachel Keeler, and I serve as the campus pastor here in our Lexington campus. So glad to see so many of you wearing your name tags this morning. So as you take your seats, would you look around for someone you don't know and greet them by name? Now, if you want to be extra welcoming, if you really want to make a good first impression, you can greet them by name and birthplace. Just say, hello, George from Chicago. Welcome to Grace Chapel. morning, everyone. As we get started this morning, I want to extend a special welcome to two groups of people. First of all, I want to extend a special welcome to our online campus who's joining us for the live stream this morning. So hello, online friends. Yeah, we're glad you're here. And second, I want to welcome anyone who's joining us for the first time today. We are so glad you're here, and we'd love to connect with you. So if you wouldn't mind taking out your phone and scanning the QR code that's on the screen or on the back of the seat, we'd just love to know your name and how you found us. Also, after the service, we'd love to give you a free cup of coffee to thank you for coming. So you can head out to the Welcome Center in the lobby and connect with someone from our welcome team. Well, speaking of people who are brand new to Grace Chapel, this is a very exciting day for our church. Last week, we announced the selection of our new candidate for a senior pastor, Pastor Joshua Clough. Yeah. Joshua and Claire, we are thrilled that you are here. And since it is your first time joining us, if you would like to scan that QR code and we can answer any questions you may have about our church. In all serious note, though, uh, we are thrilled to have Pastor Joshua preaching live today. After the second service, we'll host a Q&A session with Pastor Joshua and with Carrie Tibbles, the chair of our search committee. If you'd like to submit some questions that you'd like to um, have Joshua address, you can use the form on our senior pastor search page through our website, through our app. If you're not able to join us for that, you can watch the recording later. For those who are voting members of Grace Chapel, we have the exciting opportunity to vote to approve Pastor Joshua as our next senior pastor. Voting begins today and ends next Sunday. Members should have received via email a ballot this morning. It, the link is also on that senior pastor search page. And for those who need them, paper ballots are available at the info desk. Well, as exciting as it is to be welcoming a new senior pastor, there are also some great things coming up this month that I want to let you know about. First, on Friday, March 22nd, from 6.30 to 8.30 in the courtyard, we'll host an all-campus spring thaw. So join us for some good, old-fashioned church fun and fellowship. We'll have a potluck dinner and dessert, some musical entertainment in the form of an open mic, and some crafts for the kids. So I hope you can be there for that. And Easter is coming up in just a few weeks, and this is such a wonderful opportunity for each one of us to invite someone we know and love to come and see what life with God is all about. We have these little Easter invitation cards with the service times on them, so you can grab a few of these on your way out and be praying for God to give you an opportunity to invite someone you know and love to come and check us out. We are so blessed to have so many opportunities this Lent and Easter to invite people to find meaning and purpose in a relationship with their Savior. And none of that would be possible without your partnership. Whether it's Lent small, Lent small groups for adults, Holy Week meditations, meaningful times of worship, the learning that happens in Kids Town or student ministry, None of that would be possible without your generous giving. Not only does this enable us to reach out to members of our congregation, but also to those among our family and friends 
who feel disconnected from church and far from God. It's your giving, your serving, your praying, your invitations that enable us to extend God's love and God's grace to more and more people. So thank you so much for your generosity. You can give in the giving boxes in the lobby, in the plates that we'll pass in just a moment, on our website, or on our app. Let's pray together. Lord our God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come together, to gather as your people, to pray and celebrate and learn together. We thank you for the joy we find in worshiping you together. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of the church and for this church in particular. Thank you for forming a place where we can discover the joy and peace and freedom that comes from knowing you. Thank you, Lord, for all those whose giving and serving and prayers and invitations make it possible for more and more people to discover your love and your grace. And Lord, on this very special weekend for our church, thank you for all the work that has gone into this process from the search committee, from the elders. Thank you for the Holy Spirit leading us to Pastor Joshua and for the ways that you have gifted him and called him and prepared him for this role. Lord, this morning we pray for Pastor Joshua and his family and for this Grace Chapel family. Lord, bless Joshua and Claire in the months to come. Give them deep joy and peace. Watch over them and protect their family. And Lord, give all of us listening ears. Give us hearts surrendered to your will. May your will be done through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's continue to worship as we bring our offerings to the Lord.
It gives me great pleasure to introduce our preacher this morning. Reverend Dr. Joshua Clough comes to us from Church of the Resurrection in Kansas City, where he is the lead location pastor of their Overland Park campus. We are so excited that Joshua and his wife Claire are with us today because they come as the unanimous recommendation of the search committee and board of elders to, as our next senior pastor candidate. So welcome today. Part of that process for me was getting a chance to also talk to people who've known Joshua well. And a highlight conversation was with Todd Bolzinger, who is an expert in adaptive leadership and was um, Joshua's mentor at Fuller Seminary during his PhD. And I'd like to share Todd's words with you today. Reverend Dr. Joshua Clough is the kind of pastoral leader every church wished they had. He has experienced the breadth and challenges of life and that have made him humble and the deep love of God that makes him hopeful. His smile and enthusiasm is infectious. His sharp mind and searching heart is inspiring. He is that rare person who can bring both light and warmth into every room he enters. And when he leaves, you realize it was never about him in the first place. Christians of every age can look to Joshua and will discover the face of Christ reflected back. Joshua and Claire, welcome to Grace Chapel. I, I am so thrilled to be here. Thank you, Carrie, for that introduction. And I want to say hello to each of you at the uh, campuses at, at Wilmington and Watertown and East Lexington and Foxborough online campuses. Did I get all of them? <laughs> and Lexington here in person. I am just so grateful and thrilled to be here with you to share this message with you today. And as introduced, my name is Joshua. And on behalf of my wife, Claire, and our little girl, Ada, we're grateful for the welcome and the hospitality you have provided us today. Now, I have to tell you just a little bit about our family here. This is a picture of us with Ada there in the center, and uh, she just turned three years old, and it was also the day of the Super Bowl. The Chiefs won the Super Bowl, just to remind you of that. It also so happens to be Ada's birthday, and so we had a big birthday party, and she is getting really used to the Chiefs winning the Super Bowl on her birthday. That's going to be a problem for us later, I think. But uh, anyway, uh, I, I want to tell you about how I first heard about you, about your church, about Grace Chapel. And uh, it was some time ago, and I remember reading about your church and that you were searching for a new senior pastor. And I stumbled across your website, and I looked around, and I read all about you and learned that you are a multi-generational community looking to to connect people across all generations. You're a diverse congregation. You're, you're engaged in digital online ministry. You are connecting with people in neighborhoods across the greater Boston region. And I mean, your, your work, your ministry is really amazing. And so I felt my heart leap just a bit. What did I do next? I closed my laptop as quickly as I could. <laughs> I, I serve this amazing church in Kansas City and I love the people of that church. It's a great church to be a part of. And I wasn't exactly looking for a new job, but I knew, I knew that God was preparing me for something. I knew, I know that God has been preparing you for something as well. It was a little bit of time after that that somebody reached out to me and they said, hey, have you heard about this really great church in the greater Boston area named Grace Chapel? And I said, funny you should say that. Because I have looked into them, and this looks like an amazing church. And so uh, that, to me, was an invitation to begin to pray about what God might do within my heart and life, but also in the life of your church. And, and I remember one day just standing there, opening my palms and praying and, and surrendering myself to God. I prayed, God, help me to listen. Help us to listen. Help us to hear from you and what you would have for us. Lead me and guide me. And as I prayed that prayer, I trusted that God was guiding this process along the way. I want to tell you here up front that, that if you would have me, I would love to be your next senior pastor. 
I would love to serve you and your church and to build upon the 75 years of history, this amazing history that has been formed here and all the work that God has done through you and this church, and then to dream with you about the future. I would love nothing more than to do that with you. So what I want to do today is turn to Jesus' words, his most important words, what he called the great commandment, this commandment that organizes, orders our entire lives, how we live, how we believe, how we practice our faith, and how we surrender our lives to God and his leading as we seek to live out that great commandment to love God and to love people. My, my hope and prayer today is that you are inspired, that you're challenged and encouraged by this message in some way. I trust that God will speak to you and speak to your heart. So let me begin with a question. How do you determine what is most important? What are the things or the people, the places? What are those things, the values and virtues? What are those things that are most important to you? And how do you determine those things? Well, it's a good question to ask. You know, for me, important things include things like running. Claire will tell you I run way too much. And coffee. I grew up in Seattle. And so... I drink a lot of coffee, probably too much coffee. You catch a theme, right? Too much running, too much coffee. It just keeps me going. I love these things. Uh, being a husband is really important. Being a girl dad, emphasis on the girl dad part, is really important in my life. I love being a dad. And here's a photo of Ada uh, upside down. Unicorns and princesses are my life now. We, we respond to this question with all kinds of answers, our passions, our pursuits, what we love, what makes us who we are, the purposes that God has given us, and, and each of these things are important. Perhaps it's our careers or our families, it's some combination of all those things. These are really important things. I love how David Brooks, the author and professor, talks about uh, those values, the important things of life, and he, he contrasts resume virtues and eulogy virtues. Resume virtues are those things that that are important, and, and perhaps they go with us throughout our lives, and, and those are things like our job title, our, our status, perhaps the money that we earn, or the corner office, or, or the ways in which we invest in our community. Those are great things. But he distinguishes them from, uh, he, he talks about uh, uh, eulogy virtues as opposed to resume virtues, saying that, that eulogy virtues are those things that, that people say about us when we've passed away. Perhaps our family, our friends, were they loving? Were they caring? Were they compassionate? Were they brave and courageous? Did they live fully in love? Were they in healthy relationships? Did they give their time and their energy and their talents that other people might be built up? Those are the kind of eulogy virtues that, that most of us want to live, live by. And, and we're meant to ask this question about our faith too. What are those important things? We're meant to ask, well, how do we practice our faith? And, and what, are we, what are we meant to believe about our faith? There are some really, really important things. Jesus was asked a similar question. What are the most important things? So during Lent, you've been, you've been studying Jesus' final week in the Gospel of Mark. You've been in this great study, and you've been looking at this prayer as well. Thy will be done. This prayer that Jesus offered as he gave up his life. God, thy will, your will be done. And for you and for me, we're praying this prayer as a way of surrendering ourselves to God's leading in this moment as a church, and for Claire and I as a family. Now, I'll pick up a little bit where Pastor Brian left off last week. And first, just a, a reminder of, of Jesus and his ministry, his early ministry. So he spent about three years in Capernaum in this great town. Here's a, a photo of the overview of the ruins of that town. And, and this was his home base. You see there a picture of this, or the synagogue there in the center, and, and the, the roof is... Peter's mother-in-law's home. This was Jesus' home base, and you can see it's right there along the Sea of Galilee. Jesus would travel from this place, and he would cross the Sea of Galilee, going back and forth, and he would travel from town to town, teaching and, and preaching. He would share about the message and the love of God, and, and he would go about healing people, inviting people to follow him. This was his home base. Every so often, he would travel to Jerusalem, and, and leading to the final week of his life, preparing for Passover, Jesus and his disciples, they, they travel from Capernaum, on the Sea of Galilee to Jerusalem. Here on the map, you can see just where Jesus travels. So Capernaum at the north is the Sea of Galilee, and uh, one of the routes that you could follow was down along the sea, uh, down along the Jordan River to the, the Dead Sea. That was one possible pathway, but there was another pathway that would take you through the region of Samaria, and you might know the story of Jesus and the Samaritans, and, and the Jewish people and the Samaritans had an often contentious relationship, and Jesus often 
went right into the heart of those relationships and tried to start relationships and invite people to follow him. And so these are two possible pathways that, that Jesus and the disciples take together as they're headed to Jerusalem. During the week, uh, as Jesus is preparing for Passover, uh, he spends his week teaching in the temple courts Every time I lead a group to the Holy Land, we stop here. This is one of the places where we stop to pause and remember Jesus' teaching. You can see the steps here leading up to one of the walls of the temple, the Temple Mount. And it's here that Jesus would teach. It's here where Jesus would interact with the religious leaders as they engage in contentious conversation and debate. Uh, This is where other rabbis would teach from. The Apostle Paul was thought to teach from this place as well. And so... Here is where Jesus perhaps is asked the question, as we read in the Gospel of Mark. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? This teacher of the law, uh, some translations read a scribe. This scribe was like a legal scholar. He would study studied the law, and was responsible to interpret Jewish religious laws. Now, there were 613 total. That's a lot to keep track of, right? And so this scholar asked Jesus a question. He says, okay, Jesus, of these 613, what is the most important? How do you summarize the the whole of our faith? What are we meant to do? And, And Jesus responds. He says, the important one, the important one is this. Hear, O Israel. Hear, the Lord our God is one. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is a prayer that's classically known as the Shema uh, for that word there, hear, listen, listen. And it's, it's meant to cause us to pay attention. It's our way of saying, pay attention here. God is going to speak in this moment. And so Jesus is saying, listen, here's here's the summary of the entirety of our faith. Love. Love God. God is one. We have one God, the creator of the universe. Love this God with everything that you got. Your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole soul, your strength, everything. All of who you are. Love God. This is what Jesus says. And, And really, love is one of the foundational concepts of the entire Bible. Later, John is writing his epistle, and he writes this in 1 John, that God is love. This is a foundational concept to who we are as Christian people, that God created us, humans, for a relationship. We were meant to be in relationship with one another, and we were meant to be in relationship with God. God created us for that. And and God is certainly more than love, but God is never less than love. I, I learned this lesson when I was a little guy, I learned it from my grandmother. Here's a photo. Uh, You can see her on the left, but I'm there in my grandfather's hands, and my mom there, she'd be terrified that I show you this photo because her eyes are closed. (laughs) But but I I wanted to show you my grandmother because she was an important person in my life. Before I was able to read, uh, she would sit me on her lap and open up the Bible and tell me the stories of Jesus. She would tell me how Jesus loved people and cared for people, how he invited people to follow him. And and can I tell you that, especially in the Gospel of Mark, I mean, there's some action-packed stuff there. You want to follow Jesus. It's exciting. And so because my grandmother loved me and she loved Jesus and she loved God and she told me these stories, I wanted to do the same. It was her love that began to lead me to the love of God. So one day when I was little, she asked me this question, "What what do you want to give your life to? I was like four years old. That's a big question when you're four years old, right? (laughs) She asked me, do you want to follow Jesus? I said, yes. Yes, I do. I said, yes, because I knew that my grandmother loved me and my grandmother loved God. Because of her, I I gave my life to Christ. And that changed, that, that determined the entirety of the rest of my life leading here and today. Jesus' statement, it it makes me ask the question. Okay, I'm understanding, I begin to understand this concept of love. Do I love God with my whole heart, my whole soul, my whole mind, my whole strength? Do I love God with everything that I have? And I'm guessing you might ask yourself that question on occasion. Do I, do I love God with everything that I have? We might assess our answer to that by saying, yes, I, I worship and I, I study scripture, I, I pray and I engage in community and I serve others. These are all good things. These are ways in which we practice God's love in the world in which we can check ourselves to see that we're living in love. 
these are good things, but, but here's the trap we sometimes get into. The trap is that sometimes we think we can earn God's love. We try to do the right thing, or, or like the religious leaders, we try to, to live up to all of those 613 laws that would govern our lives. Sometimes we fall into the trap of, of thinking that maybe we can earn God's love, and here's the thing, God's love cannot be earned. It cannot be earned. It's simply something we receive and that we accept. That's what God's love is like. And, and perhaps you're on the other side of that question. Perhaps you're here today. If you're new today, hi, I am, I'm new too. <laughs> if, you're, if you're new here today, or maybe new to the Christian faith, or you have big questions about Christianity and what it might mean for your life, you might ask the reverse question, well, does God love me? Does God love me? Would, would God choose to love me? You don't know the things that I've done. You don't know the regrets that I have, the the hurt that I feel, the hardship. You don't know those things. And, and I want you to know today that, yes, God does love you. God loves you with everything and says, come and follow me with all that you've got. I, I, think, of, I think of God's love like this. <laughs> my, uh, my little girl, Ada, so she, she will often wake up in the middle of the night. It's terrible. <laughs> she'll wake up in the middle of the night and she'll come and get myself or Claire and and she'll wake us up, and she'll say to me, Daddy, Daddy, I need you. I need you. And it just kind of softens your heart in that moment. And so I'll, I'll, I'll take her back to her bedroom. And, and when we get her tucked back in, I, she asks, Daddy, will you stay with me just a minute? And, and of course, I can't say no to that. So I lay down next to her, and, and I hold her hand, and she begins to fall asleep. And, and she finds my, com- my presence comforting, my love. She knows that it's there. It's there for her. It's, it's there comforting her. My presence is around her, and it, it helps her. It guides her. It helps her to fall to sleep at night, and, and to be surrounded by this love is a good thing. I, I think in, in many ways, that's like God's love for us, that, that God's love surrounds us. It's ever-present. It's God ever near to us, entering into a relationship with us, saying, I will walk with you. I will be with you. I am here for you. I'd want you to know that, yes, this God, the God who created the universe, the God The God of our cosmos loves you, and he loves me. This is is God's love for us. But it wasn't just one command uh, that Jesus gave. It was two commands. So the first one is, love God with all you got. That's the first part. But then Jesus continues, and he draws again from the Old Testament. He, He says this. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. This is good. Thank you. Amazing tech team. Jesus says this. Okay, simply love people. Love people. This is, this is important. And, and I wonder if the religious leaders rolled their eyes just a bit. Great. Here goes that preacher talking about love. We've had enough of this message. And, and for Jesus, this wasn't just the warm, caring kind of love. It was that. It's the feeling that we have when we love someone. But for Jesus, it was much more than that. It was a love that has a commitment, it's a decision, it's an action, a decision of the will to love others. And so in the, the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, this word is chesed, and it is meant to recognize a covenantal kind of a love, a love that you enter into with someone else. It's steadfast, it's merciful, it's showing kindness for, the, for its own sake, not because it's earned or deserved. And in the New Testament, the word that Mark uses as Jesus is speaking here is, is the Greek word agape, it means similar, uh, unconditional kind of love. It's a love that, that knows no boundaries. It's a love that goes to, to great lengths. It's a choice to do love. It includes action. And, and I don't want us to miss this because, again, most of the time we say, yes, I want to be more loving. I want to love my neighbor. I want to love my spouse. I want to love my kids. I want to I serve others in the world. But isn't love hard when you are immersed in relationships with others? Like my neighbor You don't know how hard he is to love. (laughs) Or my spouse, we just got in a fight on the way to church, and it's not going well for us this morning. Or maybe your kids make a decision that you think is just not quite what you want it to be, or your grandkids. Uh, Maybe the person who voted for the other candidate is misguided, or you think evil at best, right? It's hard to love. It's hard to live with love. This is a challenge for us, and And this is where Mark, understanding who Mark is writing to is helpful. Mark is writing to a a Christian group of people trying to follow Jesus and understand what it means to love others. 
as they're hearing this message from Jesus, they have in, their back, in the back of their minds what's going on around them, especially in Rome. In 64, Nero, the emperor, he, he starts this fire in Rome and, and torches part of the city, and, and everybody gets angry at him because that's what you would do when you torch part of the city. And so they begin to blame Nero, but he deflects blame, and he blames the Christians. He falsely accuses them, and they begin to persecute the Christians, and many Christians are killed in Rome at that time, blamed for this fire that's happening. And and what's also happening in Jerusalem are the Roman forces. They are in Jerusalem, and in, in 70 of the first century, the, the temple is destroyed. The Roman forces have completely destroyed the temple, and, and there's hardship and persecution for these early followers of Jesus. And so they hear this message to love your neighbor, and I think they scratch their heads and go, the Romans too? Really? Are you sure? Are you sure that we're meant to love the Romans too? And Jesus would say, yes, even the Romans And this teaching began to change the people who began to follow Jesus. We we read this in Matthew's gospel. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Uh, Peter writes to a congregation being harassed and persecuted for their faith. He says this, don't pay back evil for evil or insult for insult. Instead, give blessing in return. You were called to do this so that you might inherit a blessing. This is the instruction. This is the invitation to go and love. And and later the Apostle Paul, who took the message of Jesus to the Gentiles, he tells the church at Ephesus, he says, live your life with love, following the example of Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. This is earth shattering. This is life changing stuff. I think about the history of racism in our country and, and the civil rights movements uh, particularly led by Martin Luther King Jr. And, and that launched movements across the globe. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he wrestled with this idea of Jesus' love, and, and he said this in his sermon, Strength to Love. He said, Over the centuries, many persons have argued that this is an extremely difficult command. Many would go so far as to say that it just isn't possible. Jesus was an impractical idealist who never quite came down to earth. Yes, it is love that will save our world and our civilization. Love even for enemies. Dr. King knew the love of Christ in his heart and it compelled his action. And it's this love that he talks about that is unconditional. It's it's a love for you and for me. It's a love that propels us. It's a love that sends us in sacrificial service. It's a love that, that looks to the cross in Jesus' life as he hangs there on the cross. And so two commands... We have two commands, love God and love people. And Jesus summarizes this into one. This is the command that I give to you, Jesus says. Let me apply this in, in just a few, a few ways. I was thinking about what that image looks like to surrender our lives to God's leading, to love people, to love God. And, and you can think about two lines, a, a vertical line and a horizontal line. You have a vertical line where that's our relationship with God. You want to be, we try to be aligned with God. We work to align ourselves with God through study and scripture, through worship and, and serving others. We align ourselves with God. But, but we also have relationships that take us out, an extension of ourselves. And, and it's our relationships with our friends or our family, our neighbors, our coworkers, our colleagues, our grandkids, our kids. And at the center, at the center is where it all comes together. In between the love of God and the love of people is Jesus. In between the love of God and the love of people is this invitation to go and love others. And and here's the one thing I want you to walk away with today. At the center is this person, Jesus. And when we pray, not thy will, but your will be done, this is what we're saying. Between the love of God and the love of people is somebody. And not just somebody. It's Jesus. But it's also you and it's me as an extension of Christ in the world. It's somebody and we'll often say at the church that I serve that, that you might be the only person that some people see who represents Jesus. You know, we, we live in a, a skeptical world. We live in a world that, that has uh, turned away from church, that, that is de-churched or unchurched. And, and perhaps there are good questions and skepticism and doubts and fears. You might walk in today with some of those questions about faith. And, and, and for those of us who follow Jesus, sometimes we are the only person that that people will see who represent Jesus. And there's an invitation there to walk in the way of Christ that leads people deeper into the heart of Christ, deeper into love and goodness and mercy and justice. When we love God and we love people, we show the true heart of Jesus. It's his love that propels us. 
Uh, let me give you an example of this. I, I heard this story from one of our small groups. It's a really amazing story. And, and one of our small groups had welcomed a new person to our church. And this person had been struggling. She was a single mom and, and had been diagnosed with stage four cancer. She was caring for her mom and, and her daughter as well. And it was just a really challenging time in her life. And, and so she showed up at the church, not really certain if people would love her. And there was one small group that said, yes, we will welcome her and bring her into our group. And, and so she started to form relationships with this group. And they barely knew each other when one day this single mom found herself in the hospital, in the emergency room. And she was feeling pretty low and, and pretty unloved and, and hurting. And, and this small group sprung into action. What's amazing is that one of the women of the small group happened to be at the hospital at the exact same time. And she had her own medical challenge that she was going through. And you know what she did? She stopped everything and she ran to the other room down the hallway and found that single mom and sat with her and prayed with her and loved her. And, and all of a sudden, the small group began to spring into action. and They began texting each other and, and forming meal groups and, and finding ways to support the single mom who found herself in the hospital. They barely knew her, but they wanted to show Christ's love. Sometimes we need a somebody to show us Jesus' love. Sometimes that's what we need. Here, here's another example. And it's an example of of loving kindness in action. Uh, every once in a while, I, uh, I go and serve in our kids' ministry area. In part, I want to be a good dad, and I want to serve up there. And also, I want to model for some of us guys that it's okay to go serve in kids' ministry. In fact, it's a blast. It is a lot of fun. And, and my kid is one of those. So I go up there, and I serve. And one Sunday, I noticed that one of the amazing grandmothers of our church was serving this uh, young girl in our congregation. Her name is Lula. And she was born with a, a rare brain uh, malformation, uh, which means she isn't able-bodied like, like many others and needs a little extra care and love on a Sunday morning. And, and so Judy goes and serves and volunteers time with Lula so that her parents can worship. And so Lula knows the love of Jesus for her in that place. And, and as I was up there, I, I noticed how Judy was serving and loving and caring. And, and I wrote an email to her. I, I, I wrote to her, I said, Judy... I was moved by your care of Lula. Thank you for spending time with her so her parents can worship together. And as you held her hand, it re represents to me a beautiful picture of the kingdom of God, all of us included, all of us cared for and loved. And I ended by saying, thank you for being the hands of Christ to one of our children. This is a picture that was taken that day of the two of them. It's a beautiful image. And here's the thing. Between the love of God and the love of people is somebody, and it's not just somebody, it's Jesus. And it's you, and it's you, and it's me. It's all of us together who represent the love of Christ in the world. And here's where our surrendering comes into play. Sometimes we're asked to love people that, that maybe we don't want to love. We're invited to love people that might be hard and challenging to love. And if you can't find anybody that's hard to love out there, it might be you. You might be the one that's hard to love. <laughs> love is hard and it's challenging and it requires somebody, somebody. That somebody is Jesus. It, it requires us to surrender our need for control, our need for time, our, our, our need to be in control of everything. And Claire and I have experienced this personally. We experienced this uh, in our own lives as Ada was born. Uh, she was born about 10 weeks early. You might have heard this story. I don't want to tell you another piece of this story. Uh, she surprised us, and so we rushed to the hospital late one night, and um, she was born. And I remember all of the tubes and wires that connected her that helped her breathe, and, and there she was in the incubator, and, and this little girl that had just entered the world. I didn't know how it was all going to turn out. And, and so later in the day, I uh, prepared to go home to go get clothes because we hadn't even packed our hospital bags yet. That's how early she was. And and so I'm sitting in the parking lot of the hospital in my truck. And I just remember the wave of emotion pouring over me. And I, I, I prayed this prayer that any dad would pray in that moment. I prayed, God, if, if, you can, if you can help me to switch places with her, I would do it in a heartbeat. I would trade places with my little girl. And here I am surrendering her to you. Help her to grow. Help her to get stronger. Help her God, and help us to be good parents to her every step of the way. I remember that moment of surrender, and it was a feeling of being totally out of control. And I think that sometimes God's love is like that, that, that sometimes it can feel like we're totally out of control. 
because God invites us to take a step of courage and a step of faith that, that maybe we're not prepared for. And what's amazing about those 10 weeks in the hospital was that we experienced a lot of somebodies who loved us, who cared for us, doctors and nurses, specialists, people who loved us well. And, and we named her, her full name is Adeline, and we named her middle name Grace because of the grace of God that we experienced through that hospital stay and the grace that we experienced through all of these somebodies. There's one last part in this story that Mark shares with us. The, the scribe responds to Jesus, and, and I imagine that, that this scribe, this teacher of the law, was, was mulling it over for a minute, listening to what Jesus had to say. And he responds, well said, teacher. I think he's th- thinking about all 613 of those commandments. And he says, yes, which is unlike the other religious scholars who continue to debate Jesus. And, and, so, and so Jesus responds back. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. I think every time we surrender, we surrender ourselves to God. When we love others, we are not far from Jesus. And when we do that, we're not far from the kingdom of God. I'll share one last story. I'll close with this one. A, a few weeks ago, after the, the great Super Bowl win, I'm really trying to, to, you know, remind you here. You know, there was this amazing parade, and everybody was there. Travis Kelsey was there. Patrick Mahomes was there. Tom Brady was not there. (laughs) Taylor Swift was there. And it was an awesome day made awful, made awful by a couple people's decision to turn to violence. And uh, a couple people started shooting in this crowd. It ended up that one person died an innocent bystander, and more than 20 people were injured, um, many of those kids. And it was this awesome, awesome day and celebration that turned, that turned awful. But what happened in the aftermath was a church set into motion. It was a church across Kansas City, all different denominations and churches and nonprofits that got together to say, we want to be the church in Kansas City. We want to love people well. And they simply called themselves the church in Kansas City. We were a part of that group of people and, and they wanted to put thoughts and prayers into action. And so what they began to do was uh, provide a way for people in Kansas City to pay 100% of the medical costs, uh, 100% of the funeral costs for the person who died. And and all of the medical costs for the families impacted by the violence and setting up a fund for people impacted by violence in the future in Kansas City. And it was a vision of the church in motion, the people of God pursuing Christ, living out Christ's love in the world. It was a vision of what the church could be in Kansas City, what it longed to be and what it will be. It's a vision of the church set in motion for greater Boston. It's a a vision of the church across the world when When Jesus invites us to love others, it's what it looks like for us. And so we ask ourselves as we pray this prayer, thy will be done. What do we need to surrender to be a part of that vision of the church? What do we need to surrender? Perhaps it's our hurts, our addictions, our imprisonments. Perhaps it's it's our our doubts, our questions, our fears, our insecurities, our, our drive, our ego, our passions, our pursuits in order to align with where God is going in our world. I think this is what Jesus gave his life to himself. This is what Jesus gave his entire life to and says to you and to me, come and follow me. You know this. You live this. It's been a part of Grace Chapel's foundation from the beginning. As those first five families got together in, the, in a basement and dreamed about the future of the church that would share the love of Christ with their neighbor and share the gospel wherever they could go and serve people across, across the world, Pastor Brian shared this last fall. He shared this about Grace Chapel in those beginnings. He said, the most striking thing about the beginnings of Grace Chapel was how focused they were on outreach and sharing the gospel and loving their neighbors and being a witness and opening the doors to all kinds of people. That's why they chose the name Grace. That's why you chose the name Grace. And I asked Brian and Karen, I asked them, in your 24 years here, what what has changed? And then I asked, what, what hasn't changed? And Karen responded quickly, what hasn't changed? She got the smile on her face. What hasn't changed is Jesus. And I can tell you that what won't change in the future is Jesus. 
And his invitation to every single one of us to love others, to live out that love, it's an invitation to you today, to each and every one of us, to live in that love. And, and I know that change can be hard, right? Change can be challenging. Change is difficult, and, and it's also exciting. It's invitational. What I know is that the foundation of this church is Jesus' command to love God, to love people. And when we do that, when we do that, I think Jesus says to us, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Would you pray with me? Let's pray. Oh God, we surrender our lives to you, to your will and your purpose. God, lead us deeper into love. And we love you. We love you with our whole heart, with our whole mind, our whole soul, all of our strength, all of who we are. And help us today to love our neighbor, even when it's hard. Perhaps for us, our neighbor is someone close to us. Maybe, maybe it's someone who's distant and far away. God, you invite us into relationships of love. And sometimes that means we must let go of our expectations in order to follow you and what you would have for us. And so, Lord, I pray that, that those here uh, who struggle to accept your love might see in you a pathway that leads to life and mercy and grace. I give thanks for the foundation of this church and who you've called this church to be and the way in which they have loved people across generations. Thank you for loving us and helping us to live with your vision of love. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I wanted to invite up uh, Claire to be introduced to, so Grace Chapel Claire, Claire Grace Chapel. <laughs> I also, wanted, um, I also wanted to invite up the search committee and our elders. So uh, you've seen the search committee in little squares on the screen, but I wanted you to get a chance to, uh, to see them and meet them. And this, this team that has been on a journey for this past year uh, wanted a chance to pray and thank God for his guidance this past year and even for the steps and next steps ahead. So let us bow in prayer from this team. As we, uh, as we finish off our service today. Please pray with me. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness to Grace Chapel. As we celebrate 75 years of ministry and look to the future, we are so humbled and grateful for your guiding presence. Thank you that we are a church full of people that love you and love their neighbor. Thank you for this search team and elders that have so faithfully prayed and sought your guidance over these each step of the way. Thank you for each person in this congregation and for those that have committed to prayer for this search over the past several months. Thank you so much for how Joshua and Claire have been faithful to their, your call in their life and that they've embraced this opportunity with courage and enthusiasm. I pray you continue to bless them and their ministry in these days ahead. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your mercy and an amazing grace that had guided us through this past year. Now, we pray that you will give us wisdom and a spirit of discernment as our congregation considers this decision. For although man does not know the mind of God, we are familiar with your ways that yields all the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, be with us and guide us in wisdom and unity. We also pray for Joshua, Claire, Ada, and his congregation in Kansas City. May your will be done here at Grace Chapel as we open our hearts and learn to surrender ourselves to you and to you only. And we ask for peace and joyous heart during this transition, not because we trust in the process and in our own diligence, but because we acknowledge the work of your hands. For from you and through you and for you are all things. To, be, to you be the glory forever. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen. Let's stand together as we... 
thank God for his love, faithfulness, and goodness. We serve a great God, do we not? Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here today to worship with us. If you need some more time to pray this morning, either by yourself or with one of our prayer ministers, our prayer chapel out in the lobby is open for you. Just two quick reminders before we head out. 
If you can join us at 12.30 for the Q&A with Pastor Joshua, that would be great. And don't forget to grab a few of these Easter cards on your way and be praying for God to give you an opportunity to invite someone to join us for Easter. And now receive the benediction. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord by loving and serving the least of our brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name, amen.